Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to the our class, our second day of online social solidarity economy. As we stated before, but we will start this uh, today with discussing about uh, several matters, uh, general issues about social solidarity economy that already raised in the first day, and also uh, Dr. Ben has uh, set some uh such arrangement to share some stories about uh some communities that uh dr ben bring to us i think um dr ben are you there yes uh okay how one how of we, the uh okay so how, how, how do we start yes please w one of the uh issues uh, that was uh, raised uh in uh may 2 was how to motivate people to cooperate. How do you motivate people to cooperate? You know, so this is uh, uh, this is uh, an issue, and I would like to hear your your thoughts or views on the, into this, yeah, uh, because you might have some experience in uh, making this happen. I have invited some discussions, but they are not yet here. But anybody you know would like to start on this. Uh, you share your experience or your thoughts about this. Who would like to start? Mr. Mangal's, Mangaliswari, why don't you start? I'm sure you have a lot of experience, you know, on this matter. How do you motivate people, you know, to cooperate? Yeah, let's, let's hear Mr. Mangaliswari and then let's listen to Mrs. Juliet. I, I, I think one of the key things that uh, people have on their time right now, have right now is plenty of time. In the past, right, everyone was so busy rushing about to work, living a very unnatural urban type of life. Uh -huh. But now, I think there is, uh, there is definitely a very big behavior okay. change because everyone is now stationary. You're at home, you're locked in. So you have the opportunity now to pay more attention to things like social media. And from there, then you start realizing opportunities, right, to learn and, and from there to cooperate. Uh, and that also includes consumer behavior. That too will change. And I think the other one is because of financial insecurity. Right, because a lot of people have lost their jobs or they suffered from pay cuts. So now I think consumption would be more on necessities uh, rather than on luxury type of goods. So I think if you can connect to people with their needs right now, and I think that would be quite important. And I think a lot of people are also using this time to relearn, to reskill, and there's a big demand for that type of services separate from essential goods. Thank you. <coughs> Was the other one recalled, Chandra? Yes, yes. Mrs. Juliet, and then uh, I think after Mrs. Juliet, and then we should start over our first session of the second day with uh, Dr. Denison. Okay, uh, mine is actually a question uh, for Dr. Ben, and that yeah. is like what we learned last week, uh, there were so many good things and of course very good case studies, but uh, it can also be frightening for those of us, some of us who may not have experience in this area of SSE. So when mm -hmm. we were to apply some of these principles, how do we do it? What are the actual steps? That's one. Two, is it, it appears so big, so where do we start? And, uh, and uh, yeah, maybe you can just start up to share this. Yes. Actually, you know, uh, when I started uh, this, uh, I had to call on my friends. So I started with my friends because they know them. I know them already. One of my friends, Dr. Ofrenel, Rosalinda Ofrenel, she's here already. She was my friend since we were college. So the trust was there already, you know. Uh, the issue of trust is no longer an issue. Yeah, she, she knows me, you know, uh, and uh, I know her. And she's been involved also with uh, uh, 
you know, uh, development work, especially with the home-based workers. Now, all of us are consumers, you know, but uh, the home-based workers are producers. They're looking for consumers. So now, uh, we have to figure out how are we going to bring the consumers. And so, uh, before the uh, lockdown happened in March, we were actually organizing bazaar already, you know, the university. And we we're planning to hold that uh, uh, every week, I mean, every month, once a month, until, you know, we're able to develop a, uh, how do you call this, uh, subscribers, you know, those who can subscribe. But then the lockdown, lockdown came. <laughs> so it halted, you know. Uh, but maybe we can call in uh, Dr. Ofrenio later on, uh, Chandra. Yes, sir. So, so, Dr. Ben, are you saying that we can begin with just a few people and it's not an uh, entire village or community of farmers or producers and the consumers? We can just begin where we are with a few people and uh, from there we find uh, matching consumers and producers and connect together? Yeah, like I said, my sister-in-law, you know, I don't know if she's here already. She started only one producer, you know. Yes. But that producer, he has a uh, big farm and he was raising fruits. And because of this lockdown, logistics and transport was very, very uh, problematic. Yeah? And so uh, he was praying, you know, uh, how, how are you going to do this? Uh, so my, my sister-in-law, this producer, and she called her friends. Yeah? I have, you know, uh, 50 baskets, you know, and you'll be able to get one basket. So she, she started that way. And then she realized, hey, I can do this, you know. I can do this with more producers, you know. So uh, this is uh, the thing that happened, you know. It can be like that. Actually, many of these uh, platform right now, online platform, they started with Facebook. Started with Facebook. They have friends in Facebook and then they say, oh, I, I have this, you know, good product, you know. And this, uh, this farmer or this, uh, you know, they, they make this product. Actually, in this kind of uh, business, the story carries, you know. You have to have a story. Yeah. It is your story that will generate interest among the buyers. Yeah. Thank you. Anyway. Thank, thank you, Ben. Uh, yes. Thank you. I, um, uh, we started a bit early uh, this afternoon because the last time when we ended, we didn't have enough time for people to talk and interact. And so we requested Dr. Ben to come in early uh, so actually this time, we, we got a shocking news that there was no electricity or power in Manila because we had told people to come in early. But, but thank God, the electricity worked and Ben was in, I think, by about 3.15. So the early part was just a conversation yeah. based on a, a string of questions uh, that Dr. Ben had uh, collected from the last round, and he had listed them, it's available. Dr. Ben also answered the main question that Shukri raised the last time, which is, is SSE um, socialist? He didn't use, uh, uh, Shukri is here, I know, but Shukri didn't use whether this is Marxist or is it capitalist? And Ben produced an excellent explanation Take for about five to seven minutes as a background document. All the lectures, uh, all the talks from the day one has been recorded and it's on the YouTube uh, as um, ESSEC, SSE Online Academy material. Uh, the uh, three talks uh, last week, plus Ben's capitalism, socialist theme, as well as the introduction uh, to SSE and even today uh, my session now followed by Dr. Eri from Bina Swadaya her session and finally we'll go into a dis discussion mode with Dr. Ben but I do notice a lot of very senior people already around I see uh, Professor Rosalind uh, from UP uh, she herself is an expert 
on many of these themes like gender and being an academic at UP for I think all, all the major periods and others as well, uh, practitioners, academicians, uh, fresh people or field people uh, in the discussion. And last week, Ben took us through talk one, two, uh, and me three to cover the five dimensions of SSE. Uh, so that is something that will come up again today. But I have been asked to share about SDGs and SSE. Um, uh, SSE, which is Social Solidarity Economy, and Sustainable Development Goals. There was a specific question that Anton had asked me, and it came up. Uh, and he also sent me an email. How is SSE linked to the local community? How is it linked to community work? And we'll take this up uh, or later with Dr. Eri and Dr. Ben as well. Uh, Chandra, if you can put up the slides. I have a PowerPoint um, which um, will be used. Okay. Now, this talk is looking at the links between SSE and SDG, or SSE as a vehicle for achieving SDGs. Next. Next, Chandra. Yeah. So we saw the themes of day one, which Dr. Ben and I did on the five dimensions. It was very fruitful. I've said this. Uh, and Dr. Ben clarified there is an economical or economy uh, ecosystem uh, and an SSE organization. Uh, and, and so we are looking uh, at the organization and its work, uh, but we are also looking at the broader uh, economic system and the questions. My outline is very simple, the SDG agenda, uh, SDGs and SSE comparison, some specific references to SDGs, one case study that I did before, something that ESSEC did uh, within this context uh, from 2017 to 2019, and my concluding points. Huh? Um, this PowerPoint is available, and Chandra would make it available to you as well. Next. So this is just the UN and the high-level political forum and the UN and sustainable development goals. I've been participating in many of the uh, CSO and high-level political forums as well. Next. Now, the SDGs came about with the 2030 agenda uh, in 2015, where all the governments of the world agreed and prior to this, there was this whole uh, post-Rio um, preparation, feedback, and input. The theme is leaving no one behind uh, in terms of people, target groups, uh, locations, and so forth. Chandra, back to the one. Yeah. And it highlights uh, three dimensions, economic, social, and environment, we looked at the triple bottom line uh, last round from SSE, but it also has the theme of human rights, uh, not just development, human rights and environment in a strong way. It has partnership, so it's linked to the values as well as linked uh, to the governance structure of partnerships. And just now, in the formal informal discussion, the question of stakeholder engagement, not just producers, consumers, but beyond, a public, private, a civil society. Next. So there are the 17 goals uh, on the left side. Um, there is um, the 169 targets. There are the 230 indicators. You can Google and get the details of the targets and the indicators here. I'll just make references to some. And the five dimensions or five principles of people, prosperity, peace, partnership, and planet. Next. Now, in the discussion, the SDGs, as I said, have the five dimensions. 
which sort of overlapped with the SSE, but the SSE has some strong elements that come out and we can fine tune it uh, in the discussion. People is at the heart uh, of the SDGs, human development, uh, personal freedoms uh, and all. Prosperity as well. It is wealth creation, economic growth, it's equitable distribution. These are themes that those of us in development work and poverty eradication work have always highlighted. Prosperity, not just in uh, profits, uh, but wealth, which includes assets, house, house, land, these sort of things. Huh? Next. A planet, uh, environment, sustainable, responsible use of the resources. SDGs bring strongly the theme of peace. Um, I think in Ben's presentation of uh, ethical values, then the peace and these come as values uh, that is embedded in the local communities in our tradition, like community solidarity, inter-ethnic or religious harmony, the theme of justice and human rights. So the development uh, agenda in this and in the specific SDGs, you see a strong uh, description of justice and human rights coming along with the theme, which is the value base, and the partnerships, governance, accountability, cooperation among the sectors. So this is a slight background to the conceptual framework. Next. Uh, these are the 17 goals. We'll go through them. I think many of you know them, whether it's poverty, hunger, health. So it is multidimensional uh, in its approach. Uh, and we would look at this, that it cuts across a 10 on inequality, whether it's environment, whether it's the cities, whether it is gender, whether it's water, uh, whole, whole strong section. 16 is the one on peace, justice, 17 on partnerships. We'll come back to this again. Next. Now, in the SSE, which Ben highlighted, governance is an important point. The governance structure that must be participatory and accountable to the people, which is very different from an individual uh, enterprise or business, the local community. Just now, there was a question about whether it's just an individual. Yes, it can start, but uh, really it's about communities, grassroots communities, uh, taking direct control of the enterprise, benefiting from it. Ben highlighted edifying values. I'll just repeat that again as a framework in case some of you were not there last week. Uh, next. Uh, you have profits, you have the social dimension, uh, and you have the planet as well. Uh, so the parallels are coming. Next. Now, if you put these together side by side as a comparison, one is the SDG principles and the SSC dimensions. There seem to be uh, quite a bit of parallels. Uh, I have not uh, put it in the same line. Uh, because I was, I was trying to do the emphasis uh, to it. But in both uh, business or element of economy is there in generating, uh, but it is not generating for self-profit, but there is the community dimension, whether it's the people uh, on both sides, you see it, um, you see the planet, the commitment to the environment in the way we take care of the resources or how we recycle, how we use the land, how we use energy, uh, how, uh, you know, these sort of things that need to become lifestyle issues, uh, but also peace partnership, which uh, might not uh, be mentioned directly in the SSC dimension, but it definitely comes under the ethical values, uh, respect, uh, trust, uh, dignity, uh, treating people as equal. Uh, these are themes that come in peace. And then the partnership, which is the governance structure. So there are a lot of parallels and we can see the value of a community-based SSE as delivering 
the agenda of the SDGs on the ground in terms of localizing SDGs. Next. Now, this is an interesting way of presenting the 17 SDG goals under the three pillars of economic, environment, and social. Of course, we used five, we can use three, uh, and then on the economic, uh, we, we can look at decent work, uh, we can look at industry and uh, infrastructure, we can look at health, their food, poverty eradication and economic well-being uh, in improvement. But the whole stack of environment, um, climate action, life below water, life on the land, how interrelated water, sanitation, some of our partners in India, like Habitat, are working on housing, uh, these sort of things. Responsible consumption and production, which is directly under SSE. Ben Sol talk about um, producers and consumers. And here, here is responsible uh, consumption. The social pillar, you have uh, education, gender, addressing inequality, not just poverty, uh, but inequality, which is a major concern, sustainable cities with the urbanization and so forth. But definitely the theme of peace, justice, strong institutions, whether it is parliament, it's human rights commissions, uh, it is accountability, anti-corruption. These sort of things are key in uh, SDG 16 and 17. Uh, is partnerships, working together, stakeholder engagement, and so forth. And many of these points we'll come back to uh, in the little highlights. Uh, next. Now, I wanted to flag out SDG 16 and 17 uh, because we looked at the other themes much more closer uh, last week as well. But here, in terms of promoting peaceful and inclusive societies, the non-discriminatory element and sustainability, uh, elimination of discriminatory laws, whether it's related to gender, ethnicity, um, disability, uh, all these concerns uh, uh, become a central uh, point that comes out in the SDGs, including appropriate legislation, policies, and action. Uh, this is at the macro level uh, that the nations have to fulfill, uh, but it's at the local level that the impact of it on local neighborhoods and communities would be felt. So anti-non-discrimination uh, is a key theme, whether gender, uh, ethnicity, uh, inequality, uh, discrimination by class, race, uh, disability, all the different categories are listed by target groups. Next. So likewise, in, in peaceful and inclusive societies, uh, this idea of uh, freedom, free from fear, uh, these are some of the indicators, uh, SDG 16.1, access to justice, to find reconciliation, um, building effective, accountable institutions uh, at the local level or at the uh, national level, a responsive, inclusive, participatory level so that the local communities and the informal sector that we spoke of or women or indigenous people will not be left behind. Next. Now, the, this theme comes uh, from it, and the photo is actually from Hong Kong uh, when there was this uh, demonstration there. There can be no sustainable development without peace, and no peace without sustainable development. And at the very core, uh, as was highlighted before, from family, local community, um, uh, it emerges upwards uh, to the whole nation and across the world. Uh, next. And S SDG 17, in terms of uh, stakeholder part participation, uh, SDGs, uh, people, uh, CSOs, grassroots, accountability to the citizenry uh, comes out very strong in the SDGs. Next.
So here, the multi-stakeholder partnership, just now Ben raised that and some of you were making comments, uh, global partnerships uh, that we see um, and, and those of us who took part uh, in the global uh, partnership and next week we have the CSO People's Forum uh, on the UN we need um, at its 75th uh, anniversary. Uh, global partnerships encouraging and promoting effective public, uh, public-private, civil society, uh, grassroots communities in that sense. Huh? And it's actually building inclusive societies, effective, accountable, transparent, responsible, participatory, uh, public access to information, protection of fundamental freedoms. These are coming quite strong uh, in the SDGs to enhance um, SSE uh, in its execution at the ground level. Next. So we likewise, I picked up on partnerships. Gender surfaces from SDG 5 is a very strong team, but it's the full uh, effective partnership, equal opportunities for leadership, decision making. Many of the SSC projects on the ground will see very strong women leadership and participation, especially in formal sector, local community. Uh, also fighting in some context, prejudice, uh, uh, paternal uh, structures, and so forth. And, but participation of local communities, even in the area of water and sanitation, was specifically mentioned. Uh, urban cities to have direct participation. We had the case study of HomeNet in Bangkok. Then the struggle of street vendors, informal sector with the city that they have organized large numbers of people at the city level will come out for urban planning, management in a much more democratic way where the poor can be part of it. Next. So I thought I will highlight uh, quickly from a case study from Malaysia because of the questions raised. Uh, is it workable? Is it an ideal situation? Uh, I would say that uh, uh, most projects would have it, some would be stronger in some areas, but this is about a community forestry project. There are other urban projects and people's participation, and I'll run very quickly yeah, through yeah. this. Uh, next, Chandra. So if you look, if we look at this, this is about forest communities, sustainable forest management, it's from Malaysia, right about indigenous people, right about community forest usage. It's about civil democracy, gender, uh, social justice, and some of the relevant SDGs addressing inequality, sustainable use of the forest, peace and justice comes into the interplay. It's about biodiversity, water sources, sustainable tourism. All this comes out in the SDGs but it has very close uh, relationship with SSE as well. Next. So the project is actually in Sabah, which is on the northern tip of the Bonio uh, area. Actually, uh, it's uh, Sabah. I think Philippines was at one time claiming uh, Sabah as a state, but Sabah is part of uh, Malaysia now. Next. So it's about a community in Kudat in East Malaysia. It's the Runos who are a native indigenous group. And this is the forest hill uh, and the height and, and around. There are about 3,000 people and there are 13 villages at the foot uh, of the forest and the hill. So you cannot access the hill without going through one of the 13 villages and the local community. Next. So the native communities did not have uh, title to the land. Uh, the, for the forest, the state uh, uh, gazetted it as a forest reserve without people's consultation. And there was a protest uh, in that area by the people. They made representation. And because it was election time, 
general elections before the 2013 uh, election, the state government de-gazetted it and gave it as a community land or heritage to the 13 villages. Next. So the people's movement actually for the collective demand of the land and their democratic rights, they actually won that a position and the land is not in individual title but as a community trust deed the whole forest and the mountain that is entrusted to the 13 villages next and uh, this is their committee unfortunately these are all um, i met them but all the village leaders are male at this point so gender balance is an issue but they actually took effective uh, ownership uh, of the forest and they manage it in that context. Huh? So it's based on conservation uh, and use of the resources. Next. So the, they were addressing the issues of poverty through micro business, through socioeconomic development projects. Ben talked about micro and small businesses, but they're all related to the agricultural produce uh, that these village people were producing. Huh? Next. And uh, they set up different types of uh, community-based micro-businesses. Uh, each village set up a project. They took up this idea, one village, one project. Some of the projects are individually run, but they are collectively marketed uh, under this uh, project, their micro businesses uh, complement their agriculture and their number like nature walk, bird's nest, gong making, bees and honey, uh, ecotourism and so forth. Next. I'll move fast. Next, uh, Chandra. Yeah, so they, the young people actually um, uh, do the nature walk because of the biodiversity, the rich uh, uh, forestry in that area. They also have this bird's nest because the birds have actually come, the swift floods, uh, and the bird's nest is a delicacy in China. Uh, and they come because the forest is still in its native stage, um, unaffected and the insects and so forth. So this is a major uh, income economic project from the forest conservation. Next. They do the gong making, which is a traditional uh, drum that is sold. They also do bee and honey, either in the forest uh, or by their homes. It's largely run by women. Uh, they do beats making. They have ecotourism and homestay uh, in that context. Huh? Next. So if we look at this uh, community project, we look at um, the five core principles, we look at income generation, we look at the use of land and agriculture, we look at the six complementary businesses, we look at the interconnection of the people, the economy, the environment. They have a very strong conservation because the mountain, they are not allowing um, you know, cutting off the trees or taking uh, other than in a controlled way. The natives now have ownership of the forest and the land. Uh, and there is a strong inter-community cooperation among the 13 villages. Next. So if we look at uh, some of the challenges uh, that they are facing uh, in terms of uh, the commodification of their culture and tourism. This was a PhD work by Professor Ong, uh, branding it in one sense, but also impacting uh, ground level women activity involved as the backbone, um, uh, but the leadership is male dominated uh, and there is uh, somewhere the, the community has to move. Uh, they have uh, access to capital, uh, which is an issue to enlarge their micro business, capacity building, um, and other areas that need to carry on. Next. 
So some lessons, collective ownership, local natives, the cultural belief and practices restrain them from um, negatively impacting the water catchment areas up on the hill. There are various stories about uh, dancing wolves on the hill, which prevents that in their beliefs. Uh, there is also policy makers and partnership with natives on, on their affinity to land and natural resources. Next. So this is actually one of the villagers um, and, and the native people uh, there when we visited them. Next. I just wanted to highlight that ASEC has been highlighting this theme of the grassroots agenda for quite a while, but I found these photos and I thought I wanted to encourage the people uh, of it. Uh, next. 2017, we had the discussion in uh, Manila. Oh, yes, I should have put the 2015 one as well. But these are sharing uh, grassroots uh, photos, uh, grassroots work. A number of us who were there are here as well in this discussion uh, at, at Manila at uh, UP. Next. Uh, this was at Singapore. Uh, at the Polytechnic, where we had these case studies on Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, at the ASEAN People's Forum in November 2018. Next. So I wanted to illustrate that we have been quite an active group on promoting this concept. Uh, this was at UNSCAP, where we had a site event in 2019 grassroots empowering themselves to ensure no one is left behind. Lessons from four countries, uh, which was highlighted. Next. And uh, this, this was our most recent in Jogjakarta, uh, which is uh, revitalizing the rural economy. Uh, and some of these points were discussed uh, last week as well. Next. So I think this is my last slide. We can draw significance and synergy from SSE, SDG micro experiences for macro policy formulation, because our stories just don't end at the grassroots. We have brought it to UNSCAP, we have brought it to the ASEAN People's Forum. Uh, and we also see SSE community solidarity based initiatives uh, as a drive uh, as an integrated approach uh, to SDG implementation, actually the localizing uh, of SDGs. Um, sorry, I took a little bit more time, uh, but this is an overview to see um, that conceptually uh, and in practice ways, there are communities on the ground that are implementing and formulating these. Uh, we can take a few minutes uh, of Q&A, uh, if there is any comments uh, or questions, uh, and then I will pass the time uh, to uh, Dr. Eri, uh, who will take on with Chandra uh, the next session.